But the Prime Minister seems... And, and we apologise, and our governments and our councils apologise for all sorts of stuff these days. Stuff. Apologised for being a racist news organisation, even though it wasn't. Um, often people are apologising for things their ancestors supposedly did which have nothing to do with them. But try getting an apology from a government for just making a bad decision that hurt people, and it seems that is quite different. The group Grounded Kiwis was founded during the MIQ, or well, the darkest days of MIQ, when thousands and thousands of New Zealanders found themselves effectively locked out of their country. In a policy the Ombudsman this week has described as bad and all thought out and all considered that made New Zealand citizenship for those overseas or the ability to exercise it in a meaningful way like buying a lotto ticket. Um, well, one of the groups that um, uh, dealt, I think, and was probably the leading group, the leading uh, uh, group for this, and I'm just getting my notes organised, um, was um, Grounded Kiwis and those uh, overseas. Alexandra was one of the uh, spokespeople for Grounded Kiwis, and she joins us now from, from the UK. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Um, uh, look, I didn't get a surname for you, Alexandra. Oh, Alexandra Bert. It's Bert, right. Alexandra, how many people were actively involved in your organisation and what... Take us back to how you formed it and why. Sure. So we, the organisation had a leadership team of about seven of us who were previously all completely unknown to each other um, and we were all individually becoming very concerned with the way MIQ was operating, the limitation it was placing on citizens' rights to return, and also, as you mentioned before, all of the extreme hardship that this was imposing on New Zealanders. So I had, to myself, had started a parliamentary petition. I was also working with um, individuals in emergency situations, offering them free support to help with their applications, um, and then got put in touch with someone else who'd started a Facebook group, another another scientist who'd been campaigning on sort of why they weren't implementing other testing changes. And together we sort of united and thought we need a unified voice um, that can represent the interests of these New Zealanders impacted by the system. Did so you ever get close to figuring out an actual figure of the number of Kiwis who got stranded? No, we don't. We estimated... That, well, the... the Best statistics that we could find show that there were almost a million New Zealanders outside of New Zealand during this point in time. Um, I think during the course of the pandemic, something like 200,000 returned home. Um, but obviously, that doesn't necessarily mean those were all... Sorry, I shouldn't say 200,000 New Zealanders. Those were 200,000 people, which, as we know, also included sports teams and other individuals. DJs, um, friends who of the were Prime not Minister. Necess yeah. Exactly. Not necessarily New Zealanders. Um but obviously there were many, many more who wanted to get back and couldn't. Um, so it's in the hundreds of thousands. Mm. Our group represented about 30,000 New Zealanders who were part of our um, our network. Mm. So, yeah, the, num the numbers are significant. And for a country like New Zealand, significant because the diaspora, the OE is literally part of our culture. And we can reasonably exactly. expect to have a million New Zealanders offshore at any time, a huge proportion of our population because of our geographic isolation. So it's not like the government said, wow, there are a lot of New Zealanders overseas. Are we doing right by them? You could see this train coming down the track at you, couldn't you? Exactly. You know, there, there are a lot of New Zealanders that both live overseas, also a lot of people that were temporarily overseas or got stuck overseas when borders closed. Um, obviously, there was the Australia bubble, so a number of our members were, you know, New Zealanders who lived in New Zealand, who just happened to be caught in Australia when the bubble closed yeah. um, and were desperately trying to get back. So there were a range of different New Zealanders in different circumstances. Um, but I think you're right that there was very much the sense of the, almost a kind of us and them in terms of the New Zealanders who chose to leave and those who chose to stay and, and this distinction between them. But in reality, it, it wasn't like that. You know, people find themselves overseas for all sorts of different reasons and also have all different sorts of reasons for wanting to come back. Mm. All right, but they couldn't. They had to get into this lottery system. Just how... Did you try and get back during during the lockdowns? 
I did, yeah. So when I first started trying to get back, it was the original, what they called the fastest finger first system, which was basically, we're not actually, Envy described it as a, lo- a lolly scramble. Yeah. So, which, <laughs> perfect. Um, we're not going to tell you uh, when we're going to, to release these spots. We're not going to tell you how many we're going to release. At some point in time, MIQ spots will be released. So this meant people were sitting at their computer refreshing constantly all day, all night. And this is when, you know, we heard in the media about people setting up bots and scripts and paying people on TaskRabbit in India to search for spots. For and and, and, and immigration things. consultants buying and bogusly and then on selling uh, slots and stuff like that. Yeah, I don't, I think they did put some mechanisms in place so they weren't able to be on sold, but there were all sorts of different, you know, other people trying to obtain for other people and things like that. Um, and then that was up until August last year. Then in, was it September, the whole system was frozen, so no one could get back at all. Um, and then at the end of September, they implemented the lottery model. So that was, they announced a certain day and time that a lotto would be, obviously it wasn't called a lottery at that point, it was called a, a virtual lobby, would be held. Um, and you, you went in, you entered one hour before the, the start time, you sat at your computer and waited, and then literally a wheel went round and round and round, and then it spat out at you a number and that number determined your place in the queue. So on our Grounded Kiwis Facebook group, we had a, a running live feed so everyone could input in their numbers and basically this enabled people to work out whether or not they had a chance of, of getting through the queue. Um, and each lotto, roughly there was a one in 10 chance that you would be able to get, to get a slot. So these were very low odds um, and you could enter a hundred of these statistically and never and never get one because it was each time you entered about the odds are reset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it wasn't mm-hmm. a, a cumulative reduction. Mm-hmm. Uh, looking back now, it seems crazy. It seems a crazy system, particularly. And we had Ian Taylor on the program yesterday, Alexander, and he said, "Well, if we just implemented a better testing regime, people who didn't have COVID could have come into the country without doing quarantine. This bottleneck at our borders." didn't necessarily need to be created. And and whilst hindsight is a wonderful thing, I don't think anyone can deny the hurt and the heartbreak caused by this to so many New Zealanders. And it would seem to me on a human level that simply the Prime Minister saying sorry would at least be a start or a recognition of that pain. It has been suggested to me the Prime Minister may not apologise because the government is concerned about legal liability. Do you seek an apology to use in a legal setting or not? So the apology we we seek is is very much for those who were impacted by the system to feel that the government has recognised that uh, that there has been harm done, like you said, and that that they didn't, um, the system wasn't the best system that it could have been and and it did harm people. And we've got the court saying that now, We've got the ombudsman saying that those are two very important um, institutions in a you know democratic system, and so to have those systems who act as a check on the government essentially saying you got it wrong, and yet the government themselves still won't say we got it wrong um, is just mind-boggling in some ways. Mm. Um, I, I mean, from my perspective, I don't obviously don't know what their motivations are. Assume it's probably more more political than that they're worried about compensation because from a, putting my lawyer hat on now, I'm a lawyer as well as a, yeah. a member of um, one of the founders of Grounded Kiwis, the individuals would need to um, each establish sort of that their particular circumstances warranted some form of compensation. And they could do that whether or not the government had made an apology. Um, so, so I don't see that the apology is necessarily going to have a, a legal impact, so to speak. Um, but from the perspective of people feeling like the government is accepting responsibility, um, that's the sort of grounds on which we, we're calling for an apology. Okay, uh, I, I hear you. Has the group hung together? Of course, MIQ is over now, Alexandra, or are you still kind of operable or not? No, so we formally wound up about a month ago, um, but we wound up on the terms that if there was need for us to sort of come back together at some point in the future or to make announcements or speak on behalf of the group that we would do that. So we heard last week that the Ombudsman report would be released this week 
um, and decided such is the situation for us to to make a reappearance and to comment on it. Mm. But yeah, I'm I'm very glad for my time's sake. I have a six month old child, so I'm very pleased now that, that this has wound up because it did take up a lot of time. You know, it was basically yeah. two two full time jobs. Alexander, you're back, uh, or, or I presume you're domiciled in the UK now. I am. Yeah. How do you feel differently looking back at what is your mother country at New Zealand, at God's Own? Do you feel differently about God's Own after the events of the last couple of years about New Zealand than you did before? Absolutely. You know, I what we went through, if someone had told me a few years ago that, you know, my own country would, would lock out its citizens and prevent them from returning, I would say absolutely not. You know, citizens have a right to return under the Bill of Rights. That's complete and humane and, and insane, frankly. No, no, they would never do that. Um, and then as, as the sort of policy developed over time and as the MIQ system became what, what it ultimately was, um, I think it really impacted my view personally of New Zealand, but also the sense, as I mentioned before, of the us and them, which I just felt isn't Kiwi. You know, as Kiwis, we like to think, oh, we're such a great country. We pride ourselves on our kindness, our togetherness, our unity. Um, and instead, it was it was not that at all. I received quite a significant amount of hate mail, um, horrific emails. In fact, I just received another one this morning after an interview I did yesterday. You're kidding um, me. No, no, not at all. Some From of the who? things I've received that terrible most of them are anonymous yeah. um so obviously i'm never, not aware Tell me about of it, it. Yeah. often a, a bogus email address or we have a, a web submission on our website so a lot of them come through that way um you know people saying well oh, i don't even want to repeat what the kind of things yeah, people no, say you I, can imagine I, they're, they're I, pretty I, terrible i don't have to i get them as well <laughs> yeah um so so yeah it really did impact me thinking who you know who are these who are my fellow countrymen? I think who I thought they were. Are they those people? And is this the country that I thought, you know, I, I would return to at some point? So I've definitely heard, you know, a lot of us Kiwis overseas, we have share similar sentiments that, you know, people saying, actually, I might just stay abroad longer than I was planning or people saying, you know, well, I never want to go back. And that is a real shame because these are people that are, um, have great you know, experience overseas, they're often very bright, have could definitely contribute to New Zealand in a positive way, who now are saying, you know, we don't feel that we want to. Mm. Um, look, really interesting uh, talking to you, Alexandra, and getting this, this perspective. Um, do you in some ways, though, and I think it's a great pity that the Prime Minister does not have the humanity to apologise uh, to you, um, but are we at the stage now, I think, collectively, maybe as a world, as well as a nation, as individuals, uh, the year is coming to an end. Do you look at a world, world or living in a world where COVID and these issues are not the dominant, the dominant issues of the day? Yeah, and I think we're all very pleased about that now. You know, obviously, the, these issues have very much clouded the last few years. Um, but I think this is about people having some closure of those last few years. This is about the government saying, we're sorry for what happened in the past um, and the people who were impacted by it hearing that and thinking, you know, to the extent they can, all right, we, we want to move on. We, we need to keep looking forward rather than looking back. I think it's called truth and reconciliation, isn't it? Exactly, yep. Accountability, humility, saying, you know, we got it wrong and we're sorry. Alexandra, I thank you so much uh, indeed for your uh, time this morning from half a world away and indeed for your work um, for your fellow Kiwis um, during the Thanks. difficult uh, last couple of years we've had. Merry, uh, happy Thank holidays. That is uh, uh, Alexandra Burt. She was a spokesperson for, well, the now disbanded group Grounded Kiwis, uh, representing at least 30,000 New Zealanders of maybe half a million or more who found themselves locked out of their own country and forced to go through a humiliating lottery system to have any chance to return through an MIQ system which the Chief Ombudsman has said was ill-considered, fundamentally, and to which there were more humane alternatives that would have been more efficient for the country.